are literally living through a moment where we are all trapped in our homes because of a disease like around the world more than ever we're trapped in our homes i mean i think about what 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 would this plague have been like in the 80s we would have been we would have turned on one of four tv channels to tell us that we still have to stay inside because the government says we still got to stay inside the newspapers tell the same story and how do we know what's going on now it's like fracas we've got people who hate masks able to talk to the people who hate vaccines able to talk to the people who hate factory farming able to talk to the people who hate climate change and they're all trying to figure out who's right right now and like and we're all doing it inside and we've all got little portable devices so even when we go to the bathroom we can see who's still arguing with who about what i mean it's i i i wish i could judge it but it's too too manifold it's there's too many pieces it's too crazy to encapsulate it's wild i mean it's just literally wild we are all trapped indoors with like these these like upset you device like like work, get you worked up machines justin hall has been described as the founding father of personal blogging he's chronicled his internet and web-based adventures and misadventures first on bulletin board systems and later on justin's links from the underground and his personal blogs he joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio for a free-ranging exploration of his life on the internet. Hey, welcome Plutopians. We're here with another episode of the Plutopia podcast. Our guest today is Justin Hall. Justin has a two-decade history of pushing the limits of tet to of the networked media. Boy, I, <laughs> I screwed that one up. His website, Justin's Links from the Underground, launched in 1994, grew to thousands of hand-coded pages. The New York Times referred to Justin as perhaps the founding father of personal web blogging or journaling or whatever. And he was the focus of Doug Block's documentary homepage, which I hope we'll talk about. Uh, he's worked on web and game projects. And as a journalist, he's written for the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Wall Street Journal, New Yorker, Vanity Fair, South China Morning Post, and other leading international publications. In 2015, Justin made a documentary about himself making a web page about his life called Overshare, the overlinks.net story, which is kind of a cool thing to watch. It certainly brought back memories. And he's currently co-founder of bud.com, a business that facilitates access to and delivery of legal cannabis. Boop, boop. So welcome. Thanks, John. Good to see you, Scoop. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. So in one of the things I was looking at before, uh, uh, like just in preparing for this talk, sure. somebody said, who is Justin Hall and why is he noteworthy? Oh, yeah, Somebody right. That question, who is Justin Hall and why is he noteworthy? Wow. Uh, you know, there are so many lives that we get a glimpse of nowadays because of our technology that takes pictures and shares little bits. And uh, I'm I'm less and less sure why my life might be noteworthy. I felt very noteworthy when I was young, I think, because uh, I guess I didn't feel noteworthy. I felt like I was doing noteworthy things. I guess I still am. John, I, I'm just so grateful that I got to have access to technology when I was a young person and the internet was coming up and I was coming up and we got on top of each other and just rolled around and had a great time for many years. So it, to say exactly why I might be noteworthy, I guess, would be to say maybe I was a useful uh, prototype of what might happen if you put a lot of your life on the internet and what could happen to you emotionally, uh, which I've tried to account for. And um, and uh, also to also uh, get out of the way of new people doing the same thing and making the same mistakes. I think I'm part of a continuum of people making mistakes in media and having fun and trying to tell stories and connect with other people. I, I will say that one thing that's changed for me is I went from, um, you know, I think I was quite lonely and desperate to connect when I first met technology and the web allowed me to tell my life story in a way that a life story might not have ever been told before. Uh, so I got to try that for a while. Uh, and then I became less lonely. And so my desire and, and means of telling my life story have changed a lot. But when I was 19, I started publishing on the web. And 
I'm 46 now. So I've started publishing on the web a long time ago. And uh, that internet changed all around me, man. When I first got on the web in January, 1994, you, 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 you could surf for a while and then feel like you'd met the edge. You're like, oh, okay, I've kind of seen the internet today. Uh, and then you could go back to the internet a few a week or two later and be like, oh, there's more internet now. Um, and I think now the scope of the infrastructure is so vast that it's tough to imagine seeing the edge of the internet um, or the web, you know, the visual internet. So anyway, I was there. I, this is the longest answer. Uh, if you ask me why That's good. would I've been noteworthy, I was an early, uh, you know, sort of hitchhiker on the on the on the internet. I think uh, it was looking because. For attention. I think it was because you were buck naked. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one too. <laughs> it, I did personal centerfolds. I think that does, uh, y yes, that does, uh, you know, make the page more uh, remarkable. <laughs> well, yeah, so I was 19, so I was perfectly like just allowed to, 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 to sort of be almost an adult, but I was like, sex and drugs and the internet. Let's talk about that. That's super cool. I want to be that. So, yeah. I think that, so, that gave me. So you're people, like a yeah. Well, you're a kid from a, a you know, like a somewhat privileged white, uh, well-to-do family, and somehow you get access to these tools. How did you actually get online? How did you originally find your way to the internet? Yeah. So and to links.net. Yeah, my mom got our family a computer in 1981 when I was seven years old, and I, you know, she hired a guy to come over and give us some pirated games and teach us how to type run you know you had to type in to run the program so I learned how to and a little bit of basic coding so you know sort of started off on computers pretty hard using modems in the mid 80s to connect to bulletin board services which you know are sort of like it's sort of like a private whatsapp group um, you know but you know where you just have a collected number of people that are invited to talk to each other about whatever, usually a guided topic, but often whatever they want. And, uh, you know, private bulletin boards were very exciting to me in the mid 80s. But then in the late 80s, uh, 1988, to be precise, I, my mom hired a, a, a nanny and he was a medical student. And he let me use his like internet account in the 80s when it was, you know, email and Usenet. And I saw, you know, uh, it was a bit like what Reddit is for people, I think, in terms of seeing the subconscious of humanity and people being allowed to talk about things they're passionate about that aren't for sale in bookstores or aren't on the front page of the paper. So um, just being exposed to so many human ideas was really revelatory to me. I said, man, this internet's really great. So I spent my high school years in Chicago trying to figure out how to get on the internet. There were no commercial accounts. I got a job at a university, but I didn't hold it very long. So I had different ways. I was trying to get an internet account until I went to, I finally enrolled in college. And when I got to college, I had an internet account and I had ethernet. I had a hardwired port in my bedroom so I could plug into the internet from my dorm room. And I had a computer in 1993 in my dorm room hooked up to the internet 24 hours a day. So that was like, uh, hello, internet, I'm here. So, you know, a lot of Usenet and a lot of excitement until I finally saw this, this web. And when I saw the web, I was like, man, all this internet I've loved, but now you can use a mouse. And the ability to use a mouse I knew was going to bring in all kinds of people who had never enjoyed the internet before. And uh, I just started teaching everyone I knew how to get on the web and how to install a web browser. And putting up pages to teach them the cool things they could see on the internet, giving little guided tours of the internet, giving little tutorials of what was on the web. And after a while, I had a kind of a big site because I put a lot of stuff into it and I told people about it. So I leveraged that site to get an internship at a magazine that I thought was pretty cool called Wired. They were covering the nascent technology popularization movement and uh, they, you know, were cool and in San Francisco and they let me be an intern and someone there taught me how to register domains. And so, you know, in the fall of 1994, I was really bummed because justin.com was taken. I was like, it's kind of over, I'm too late. Um, but, you know, links.net was available, justin.org was available uh, and bud.com was available. So I got those three uh, and maybe a handful of other ones and then, you know, built my links from the underground on, you know, my personal site. 
and then used bud.com over 25 years for a series of experiments that's now culminated in the biggest experiment of all, which is that like, you know, you take my 19 year old self registering domains and smoking cannabis in California and being so psyched to have access to all that stuff. And now I have a business selling cannabis through bud.com, a domain I registered when I was 19. It's sort of like trying to make good on the, the promise of a life that my 19 year old self set up for me. So when you registered bud.com, you were really thinking about a marijuana bud. Oh man. Yes. I love, I was very fond of cannabis at that time. I had a friend who called me bud, but you know, bud has like, there's rosebud and you know, all kinds of buds. But for me, bud was flower. Yeah. Cool. Or, or cannabis flower, I should say. Yeah. And it's a great name for your business now. It's fun. It's very fun because it's short. And, uh, you know, as a URL, it's like a URL with seven letters in it, you know, so that's like a short URL. To write. So, so this is like 94, you, you built links.net and it just grew and grew. Um, and a lot of that um, is in your short documentary about your life, incidentally, which I, I hardly recommend to people. I'll put that link out when we publish this. Um, but, um, oh, and then you did the thing with Wired and we have in common an association with Wired. Uh, mm -hmm. But at some point uh, you got involved with her. You met Howard Rheingold. How'd you meet Howard? Sure. So f I, you know, I had this experience of putting together this website and, and seeing there was a bigger world on the internet out there promoting my website, trying to draw attention to myself and say, hey, I'm doing this. Somebody come look at it and getting myself into what I thought was a bastion of cool at that time, which was Wired Magazine. I'm sitting in the Wired Magazine offices sort of trying to find my way uh, with these people. And there's a guy who comes in wearing kind of brightly colored formal clothes, uh, like a jacket and a collared shirt with buttons, but like psychedelic. And painted and then, shoes. And not, I don't know what that, oh yes, yes, that's right. Van Gogh, Doc Martens and, um, <laughs> and a fedora with like some Fimo clay, serpent on it and he's just radiating enthusiasm like he's just going from desk to desk and he's so ple excited to be there and so excited about each thing that everybody shows him and it has an idea about what they could do with it or how they could connect with someone else and is very encouraging of everything that's happening I thought this guy's really like just I like this guy. So I made a point of basically insinuating myself with him and introducing myself and trying to get to know him. And uh, it's led to a wonderful multi-decade friendship and occasional collaboration with Howard Rheingold, who's a, you know, I think a prescient writer about a lot of the opportunities and challenges we'll face as we, you know, plug in all of our mind amplifiers. Uh, he's been exploring tech for a long time and he was on the frontiers of possibility for how people could communicate through networks uh, for a great many years and besides that he's just well read and uh, creative and funny and uh you know i i i i get a i very much enjoy howard rheingold and the being at wired was a chance to meet him because at that time in 1994 wired was a place where people who were trying to figure out what to do with the internet some of them found their way there and then basically by 1995 and 1996, they had become separate tribes that this one tribe that was like, we're the internet tribe was like, oh, wait, hold on. There's like the, like the capitalist internet tribe and then the like socialist internet tribe and the like, you know, Libertarian. like, yeah, vegetarian internet, whatever, like all kinds of, you know, people who are feeling that they have uh, this, that, that they saw what this technology could do and that there were different parts of it that needed to be built out. And uh, I threw my lot in with Howard uh, for a while and we had a good run of it. But, uh, you know, I think you and I, John, were both correspondents in Electric Minds in 1996, where, you know, if you had asked Howard, what are you doing in 1996? I'm building a list of all the communities on the internet. I mean, what, what a staggering idea that is today, if you're trying to build a list of all the communities on the internet. But at that time, it seemed doable, attainable. There were kind of lists that existed that you could aggregate and build upon. And like there were people tracking this stuff and you could like connect people together and by showing them what they didn't, where they could find other people. Um, the idea, you know, was fun and wild for a year or something and then crashed. Um, but, you know, 
we've been there at the frontiers for a while. We're a little older and other frontiers have emerged and we're looking out at them and hallelujah, we've been able to be a part of history. You uh, say you were influenced early on by Howard and I have to mm -hmm. admit to the fact that uh, Howard gave me my first BBS Smackdown early on. <laughs> I first started cruising the BBSs and I got on his and I was at the time I was managing a hard rock band in the Bay area and I posted something about them and he yeah. got right back and smacked me down. And the first thing I thought, well, I don't crouch. What does he know about the BBS? And, and then I read more of his stuff. I read just this guy knows what he's talking about. And I learned a hard lesson. I started reading the facts on BBS is when I came in and I learned about internet uh, etiquette and how not to be uh, as much of a jerk as I <laughs> was. He and over the years, I, I followed his adventures, even misadventures, and uh, he's definitely a treasured resource. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think we are all trying to learn how not to be buttheads on the internet together. Mm -hmm. that that's a good <laughs> lesson to learn <laughs> and to practice i don't know if you ever learn it but you just get a chance to keep practicing you pioneered spam scoop well I... <laughs> <laughs> what was the band the band was called vital signs we were uh, out of uh, san francisco and oakland it, we... it sounds like maybe out of sf general yeah, it's a general hospital. Uh, <laughs> the drummer's wife was a nurse. So we had to credit oh, nice. her with <laughs> naming the band. Yeah. Cool. But I learned not to spam much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're all, it's crazy that, you know, there's this giant attention marketplace. We're all in this marketplace. You guys are going to make this podcast. I'll be in it. And then we'll all put out some bid for attention for the people who might watch it. Say, oh, hey, here's a thing. Check it out. And then we're all competing with all the other things that people might be telling them to watch. Yeah. One good thing about what we're doing is that we don't really, we don't really have to sell it too hard. We right. just, we're doing it for fun. And, yeah. Uh, and we're getting some really good stuff that way, but um, I, I'm a little, I've been thinking a lot and studying and talking some about, um, the economy of attention and its impact on the perception of reality. And mm -hmm. uh, man, I think people are more confused than I've ever seen them before. Uh, you, you seem not at all confused these days. So that's great. It's uh, a moment. It's a moment in time. I remember uh, like 10 years ago, I was in the middle of a divorce and desperately lonely and a parent had just died and I didn't know what life had for me. Um, so, and I know that time may come again. And so you went public with that, time. right? You, you had a fairly public freak out, right? That was actually, that was 20 years ago. I had a public freak out. Um, was, was I that... was less public 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, 10 years ago. Okay. Well, that thing that you did there where you were, uh, let's say very emotional on online. Yeah. Uh, and that was totally just real, right? totally raw yeah although somebody was asking me somebody was asking me like uh but you, you were you were sobbing and having a kind of a breakdown but you had the, the presence of mind to turn a camera on yourself and then you edited the footage and you know picked the right bits and put them in sequence and then put like titles on it and you know so there's like a there's still a presentation there's still a, a, a an encapsulation going on but i think uh basically i'll give your you know, a shorthand here is I started publishing 1994, put a ton of stuff about my life. I thought, oh my God, we could build an empathy engine if we only all decided to sort of all put our difficult bits online. Let's talk about the stuff that's hard for us. What, what's suffering? What's grief? What's joy? Let's share difficult stories and tell all them from ourselves, like as ourselves, un, un, not fiction, just nonfiction, like everybody do nonfiction journalism on yourself. Let's all do it. Then we could read each other's things and we'll know what's going on in our emotional space. This was my idea of like the internet plus like attention plus people. It's like, this is build empathy. And uh, after practicing that for about 10 years, 
basically, um, I'm, I, I had a big, huge website with tons of intimate stuff on it. I had a lot of other websites I could read that were pretty intimate, although mine was pushing a lot of intimacy boundaries. And then I met someone I really wanted to spend a lot of time with romantically. And I had comments on my website when I wrote about this new relationship. People in the comments were like, hmm, based on our analysis of previous relationships and the way you're handling yourself in this relationship, we think this has like a, a, a strong likelihood of failure. This likelihood is it, it, this, this relationship is not strong because you're too fickle and you don't do this and that. And I thought I'm, I'm being subject to an analysis because I put all my stuff out there. It's kind of, I guess it's not a surprise. Maybe eventually if, you, if I'm lucky and people read my site, they might judge me. That's like, that's what I'm setting myself up for. It's like, I'm saying, please judge me by putting all this stuff out there. And I had, it hadn't really occurred to me because people weren't, had never judged me quite that harshly. People started accusing me of faking my website. They were like, we think he's making stuff up on his website. I thought this is totally crazy. Like I put up this, what I thought was like a super personal, honest website. And people are saying it's like using it against me and accusing it of me of it being fake. So I like, that's like a lose, lose. So I, I, I went to the person I was with and I said, these things are happening and they're analyzing us. And the, the person I was dating said, include me out. I do not want to be on your website. So I thought, oh my God, I can't write about this person I love. I got to shut down my, I, my, dot, you know, my daily sort of, or my weekly thought sharing on the internet. I'm, I can't believe it. This has been my companion for a decade. I've been sharing my thoughts with the internet. I'm so sad. And I filmed myself having this breakdown and I posted this breakdown online as a way to say goodbye. I'm sorry, I'm having a breakdown. I'm not, or I'm breaking, I'm breaking with my oversharing online. And then people found my video and started posting online. Like, let's go teach that guy a lesson. What a, what a cry baby, what a faggot. And, uh, and here's his address and his name and his photo. And then they found the woman I was dating and they posted her name and photo. And I was like, this is terrible. This is like, I don't want random young aggravated strangers getting worked up about my personal life. Like that's like the opposite of, of peace or, or of, of good living for me. So uh, I basically like stopped that project of, of like extreme uh, nonfiction oversharing. Uh, went through a relationship with that person, went through dating. We, we did a, a fascinating set of, we did an internet company together and then we got married and divorced. And then after the divorce started, I started writing on my website again, but everything's like super cloaked. You can't tell, you know, who's who and what's what. And it's all sort of like just trying to only hold myself accountable and not, not, uh, not implicate anyone else. And it's much less sort of raw than it used to be in some ways, but you know, so am I. That's the whole story of the internet right there in a capsule. It happened <laughs> yes. with you before it happened more broadly. And with our electorate, I mean, the whole thing, we're all living through this sort of experiment in how we can be hooked up to a shared attention amplifier. Sounds like you were an, uh, an early victim of what goes on every minute on social media these days. What's your opinion of the way personal discourse uh, or personal communication is happening on like Facebook and Twitter compared to what you experienced? I haven't yet, thanks. I haven't yet gone through the evolution where I'm grouchy and I tell people that today's stuff is bad and what I did was better. I, I think maybe I'm getting closer, you know, as I, you know, I don't know. I look at what's happening today and I'm like, there's a million platforms for people to experiment the way I did. And I would never hold back. I wouldn't really hold someone back because I needed to go through that public performance of identity formation to, to create myself and to have a chance to live and to connect with other people. So I wouldn't tell other people that you shouldn't do it. Um, sort of like you can't tell an alcoholic not to drink. You have to help them find other things they might do that are better for them. But if they want to drink, they're going to drink and the, and the booze is there. Uh, and so for, for the internet, I mean, for someone who wants to find attention it's all out there and i think the stakes the stakes seem a little higher because of things like swatting and people get swatted i get scared when when you know physical violence bridges into that i think it's all sort of, there's like especially when you think about artificial beings competing for attention with real beings and people pretending to be things they're not it's like it's such a game it's such a playland 
of, of this identity. And the tough thing is that the stakes get really serious. If you're in a place like Belarus or Hong Kong or you know America in the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody swats you or somebody doxes you and somebody stalks you, I mean, the stakes can get pretty real. But I think the, the payoff is real too. I mean, we are literally living through a moment where we are all trapped in our homes because of a disease like around the world, more than ever, we're trapped in our homes. I mean, I think about what, what, what would this plague have been like in the 80s? We would, have been, we would have turned on one of four TV channels to tell us that we still have to stay inside because the government says we still got to stay inside. The newspapers tell the same story. And how do we know what's going on? Now it's a fracas. We've got the people who hate masks able to talk to the people who hate vaccines, able to talk to the people who hate factory farming, able to talk to the people who hate climate change, and they're all trying to figure out who's right right now. And like, and we're all doing it inside, and we've all got little portable devices. So even when we go to the bathroom, we could see who's still arguing with who about what. I mean, it's I I, I wish I could judge it, but it's too too manifold. It's there's too many pieces. It's too crazy to encapsulate. It's wild. I mean, it's just literally wild. We are all trapped indoors with like these these like upset you device, like like work, get you worked up machines. <laughs> well, the way we're doing this podcast right now on Zoom, mm -hmm. and we're in different parts of the world, and uh, business has changed dramatically because of that, uh, uh, that ability to not be in the office. Do you think after the virus has gone away, or at least been subdued, do you think we, we will ever go back to the old way of doing these things? No. No, I think it's pushed too much like telehealth, too much teleeducation. And I think we're all learning like, ah, for kids, it's better if they're in the classroom and close to each other. But on the other hand, there's like a lot of kids who need access to different kinds of learning. And that, those are being pioneered right now. And there are people just bang, banging away so hard to figure out how to do learning in this circumstance. And there are people who figuring out how to keep people from feeling isolated in these circumstances. And all that work we're doing as a species to learn how to take care of each other and be connected when we're you know, trapped at home or when we're not able to get out. I mean, I think it's relevant for an aging globe for uh, you know, uh, if we want to cut down our carbon emissions and people travel less, like, I think it'd be kind of good if there are fewer, you know, sorts of giant conventions, if people could do stuff online. Uh, I mean, I don't know, some people meet their future, you know, meet their futures at conventions. And I wouldn't, you know, I had to go to Wired to be in the milieu with the people who were going to help me to see what I could do. So I wouldn't hold people back from in-person experience, but, you know, there are kids growing up today who will say, you know, I'm, I'm able to create myself and connect online and that's enough for me or that that's quite rich for me in a way that my town will never afford. And for all the years that we were raving about what the internet could do for people, you know, one of the things we said is if you are a little bit different living somewhere uh, where people don't get, get along with you or don't get off on what you're doing, come to the internet because you'll find people who are like you probably. They're out there somewhere. Uh, that was the whole the basis. Help you find them. That was the whole basis for Fringeware, which was the thing that I had started uh, with uh, Paco Nathan back in the early '90s. And we we found people all over the place, and they were all just sort of like on the fringes. And some of them were like precursors of what you're seeing online now. Um, mm -hmm. I think we probably should have seen the downside of it back then better than we did, but we were much. Well, I just, mean. We were just trying to always trying to build the best. We were like, we'll build the best part of this. This is only the good part. This is the part we like. We'll build this. <laughs> and then it turns out, oh, well, there's this whole shadow, you know. I remember there were a bunch of people who said, hey, really, you don't want this to mainstream. Let's just keep this for ourselves. And that thinking went on for a while. It probably slowed things down a bit. That and I don't know whether that's good or bad. Is it good to slow things down? Or I mean, what, I don't you know, know AOL either. sort of hooked itself up to the Internet and it was game on. You know, I mean, part of what is driving us crazy right now is that so many people have a voice and can express themselves online, but at least that means we know what they're thinking, right? People were kind of holding this stuff in and it was festering before. And now it's all kind of blown out in the open and it's a really tough time right now, but maybe we just have to get through this tough time before people start to 
adjust i guess yeah that's the thing right do are we comfortable knowing this much about other people like oh i didn't know there were people in my community who think medical science is not to be trusted like oh okay well you know i disagree and i thought everybody around me thought the way i did um, yeah yeah you know and now it, you it, have an opportunity to try to convince them otherwise right or they and they have the opportunity to convince me or we could just sort of hang out in our separate little internets you know how the how we consume media and share media when we don't leave our houses you can't put a flyer up on a street post anymore nobody sees it so if if nextdoor.com is the only way you're able to talk to your neighbors they shape the conversation so you know the conversation's always being shaped by somebody before it was maybe more about local government and a few media entities and now it's about platforms and you know influencers or people who have sway over those platforms so uh you know humanity continues to challenge itself and so john just as we get used to sharing this kind of awareness of what our neighbors might be thinking we'll have some other thing that knocks us off and we have to say oh my god i didn't know that about them Woo. Those other people, they're so strange and different and difficult. We'll be remind we'll find new ways to be reminded of that throughout our time as a species. Maybe the tribes will find a way to come together. But but before we talk too much more about the present, I want to go mm -hmm. back for one other thing, which is your cinematic career. <laughs> um, homepage. Uh how oh, did yeah, sure. you and Howard get connected with Doug Block? Where did that come from? Yeah, so uh I think basically, and you know, I did all did a lot of this writing and online stuff, and then at some point, I was, um, I think I had sort of put myself out there enough that I was, when reporters wanted to write about the internet, sometimes they would call me and they would say, "Hey, this guy is an internet expert." We talked to Justin Hall. So, in one of the biggest ones I got was I was in the um, in the New Yorker, the, uh, the magazine, the New Yorker, where a uh, writer there quoted like some like some some indented paragraphs from me so it was like big quotes and so um that sort of in that meant that because that magazine that then led i think uh the writer was a guy named john seabrook and he uh knew john uh, i'm sorry i guess he knew doug block or was connected to doug block through somebody anyway this basically i tried to get attention for myself i got myself into a big magazine the filmmakers found out about me from that writer and this guy, Doug Block, said, I want to make a documentary. I'm looking for some interesting people on the internet. Maybe this Justin guy can serve. And I think that I think for Doug, the thing I did that might have been helpful is I I like reached out at one point pretty early on and grabbed his camera and then turned it around and like pointed it back at him and said, All right, you have to be in this too, because I'm a personal media maker and it's disingenuous for you to just make a movie about a personal media maker without sort of making personal media so he was already a personal media maker i mean his films were very kind of local in scale into his lived experience of some story he wants to tell but i think actually being like a film character for him was like a little bit like Woo. and doug showed up when we were in the middle of doing electric mines so that was uh, i guess part of the film is like looking at what was happening there Mm -hmm. wow. Yep. And it's interesting. It's such a time capsule, right? We're having a drum circle and singing Kumbaya and, and saying we're going to make money and build an index of all the communities on the web. And then Doug puts in like this kind of cynical trade, like eight months later, they're bankrupt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another question. Uh, uh -huh. And I should mention Homepage was a documentary that was uh, pretty widely released back then. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people today might not have seen it, and I'm not sure where you can find it online. I bet oh, you he, can, so though. He took the trouble. I think there was enough inquiry that he took the trouble last year, two years ago, to sort of uh, it, give it a 20-year kind of polish up and re-release. And so now I think it's on, you know, Netflix, iTunes, you know, oh, Apple, cool. whatever. It's on different content networks. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, or, you know, there's there's more stories. Even Doug Block has more stories. I mean, you already kind of know that story, right? So it's, yeah. Anyway, I, I just, because he asked me to come to a screening or two last year to sort of talk about homepage 20 years later. And so I was at these film society meetings where they showed, or documentary group meetings where they showed this film and then I answered questions and sort of makes my skin crawl to watch me sort of, you know, just, yeah, just being me a while ago. It's just kind of weird, you know, just kind of weird to live with yourself as you're, as you change. 
Well, and that's what we're all learning to do now because now we have documentation of kind of everything. Yeah, well, so Electric Minds, uh, as you mentioned, Electric Minds didn't get uh, all of the funding that it was hoping to get and had to be sold to Duran Communications. Um, there was a migration of Electric Minds. When Howard sold it, uh, he got the buyers to agree that they would keep the community together and they would just kind of move the whole community over to their platform or whatever. Caucus. Did, yeah. Yeah. Did you migrate with that? Um, so my confession is that um, as a community member for those kinds of online communities, I tend to be like a ready post. I'm, I just like, I don't, uh, I'm not like a good long-term member of the, like the, I joined the well and I couldn't, I couldn't, I just, I'm, I'm too exploration oriented. Like I too much curious to see what else is out there and what's new and what's evolving and come back through. But I'm not like, I just have never, like even massively multiplayer online games. I tried playing world of Warcraft and after a few weeks, I'm sort of like, okay, I see the, the shape of this landscape and the way the game works. I want, and, and, and I like these people, but I really want to play a new game. Um, and so uh, that's the same thing for me with like, you know, being on those threaded message boards that Howard had set up is sort of like coming back to those threads and revisiting some of those conversations and things like there is like, I'm just, I have online forums, chat forums that have been running continuously since the nineties or like the group has stayed together since the nineties. And I'm in those forums and I check them like twice a year or three times a year. I'm just like, I'm not, my mindset is not like engagement with those things. And I think that was tough for me with Howard as Howard would say, you know, as you alluded to, he's like, here's the rules. You're going to be a host, check these threads, get back in there. Here's how you maintain them. Don't allow these kinds of posts, stay on top of it. I'm not good at staying on top of that. So like right now I'm working on bud.com and I have a role that's a lot about what I'm good at, which is finding technologies and making integrating systems and making configuring things but i'm like not the guy who's like revisiting the like the thing that needs to be checked up on every single like day to make sure it's you know whatever you know that's funny uh i um i went to work for one day at hotwired you know i was uh -huh. running the electronic frontiers forum and they were going to give me an additional thing. They were going to have me be a, like a community manager. And I got in and I started doing just the thing that Howard was trying to get you to do. And, and they decided they didn't want me in there because they wanted somebody who would just be a monitor, you know, and just like, yeah, you know, break not, up not talks, actually host, not actually. Yeah. Not actually try to draw communication out. Sorry, Scoop. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask you more about, bud.com. Um, okay. And, and what caused the transition from your previous activities to this new business that uh, has become quite a, uh, a big business and, and a controversial one? Some Republicans love it. Some Republicans hate it. Uh, I love it, but <laughs> sure. I'm not a Republican. I'll tell you, in the last election, it, people thought it was going to be a blue wave, then they thought it was going to be a red wave, but it, some people said it's actually more like a green wave, because if you look at the states that legalized in the last election, it's like you got a Dakota, like one of the Dakotas, which is a very Republican place. You got New Jersey, you got, you know, Arizona, you got different states that are, um, I think it's not, when you say it's controversial, it's, it's sort of in a way, the least controversial it's been in our adult lifetimes as a, as a substance, right? It's no longer like, I mean, if you, if I told you, you know, uh, her mom uses pot, uh, like, you know, like, or her grandma uses pot, people would be like, oh yeah, grandmas use pot. And then they'd be like, you know, just it's, it's, there's more of it around, but I'm deep in it. Let me tell you how I got there, Scoot. So I uh, basically registered this domain, put up poems on it for a while, ran a group weblog on it for a while, had an online game on it for a while, just tried things because it's such a fun domain. I was like, I'll just make, see if it'll be a fun place to host a group weblog or a video game. Or uh, finally in 2013, people began, and, and then I think in, I started to see pot coming. So I thought I'd turn it into a pot oriented site. And I, I, I spent like three, I spent like a month and a half building like a, like a Reddit dig kind of thing about pot in 2010 and putting it up online so that like, and then I like, 
put in all these ads and like had it just, I was like, maybe bud.com could just like be a, you know, a content site with advertising. And I made a dollar a day. And then I, I, the whole thing crashed and I put up like a Google park domain and I made $2 a day. So it was just sort of a, a strange, like there was no, there was no passive income to be made from bud.com. I was like, I can't just set this thing on some kind of content autopilot and let it go and have it like pay its bills um, or do something great. So I was just sort of letting it, you know, we try another friend of mine, we tried putting up like a truly anonymous, like 4chan uh, kind of service on bud.com. And it got like, and we started getting people saying, um, I will sell you pounds of cannabis. I live in Indiana. Every order gets a free pack of Xanax. Um, you know, call me at this number. And it was like, oh man, this is so illegal. I think I'm, I'm going to be in trouble for even having this stuff on my web server. So like that format we had to take down. So once I'd sort of eliminated some of the possibilities for the different types of things I could do, at the same time, I started getting phone calls from people who were saying like, hey, I'm from the cannabis, the nascent cannabis industry. It's 2013. And we think your domain could do something. Let's have some meetings. I started having like two or three meetings a year with people from the cannabis, from the you know, growing cannabis industry who had all sorts of schemes, but none of them, none of the schemes really seemed to, to me to resonate with the domain. The first scheme that somebody told me was a B2B scheme for like a, a crowdfunding B2B. I was like, no, 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 this is like, this is for people. This is for anybody. My dream was that I could set up Craigslist for weed so that like anybody could sell weed to anybody. Cause it's, you know, it's sort of like you can grow it, you could sell it. But in California, the architecture of, of the cannabis business is, is really about like safety, testing, regulation, compliance, and like, like a, a limited number of people who are able to sell weed. So once I go over the idea that like the law was never going to allow me to run Craigslist for, for pot, then it was like, okay, how do I find a way that a lot of people can make use of bud.com? So I made, I had a t-shirt printed up that said, I own bud.com. What should we make with it? And I started going to cannabis events and just walking around and introducing myself to people and saying, Hey, what are you up to? Would your project be good on bud.com? Should we do your thing here? Or what should we do together? And uh, after, you know, like, I think I did that for three years or so. And then I finally went to a international cannabis business conference and networked my way around and said, I got bud.com. And finally somebody said, why don't you talk to that guy over there? Uh, it was a guy named Dean Arbit. He had, he was running, he had a publication, uh, an event that were both in cannabis. He had a, a company that made a ton of pre-rolled joints. And he had a company that was uh, that he was working with that did edibles. So he had a lot of visibility into the California cannabis industry. And he said, let's use your domain and make a place where we can sell cannabis. And, you know, I think when I was 19, I was like, commerce sucks. Um, and then I like lived through Electric Minds with John and I lived through Wired and I lived through my own attempt to do a game startup. And I saw that actually building a sustainable business is like a serious challenge. And if you wanna have a life where you do something you enjoy and you can pay a salary to yourself and people you like working with, you might have to have some commerce in there uh, in our society. So like this seemed like a way that I could, we could have commerce and I could help control it. Uh, and because I would be a co-founder and chief technology officer, cause that was a hoot for me. Cause I don't, I don't know that I'm really like a, nerdy enough to be a, a, a CTO, but I'm the nerdiest of the bud.com co-founders. So it's me and Dean. And then now we've got a team of like 10 people who are maybe 12 people and we're banging away on weed delivery. And we just launched a new version of our platform last week. And we've got, you know, people up and down the state, Southern California, Northern California, able to order pot delivered to their homes. I mean, this is like a crazy moment in history when this thing that was banned and difficult and um, you know underground is becoming mainstream. So John, you talked about whether the internet is okay as it becomes mainstream. In our case, you know, I'm in the cannabis industry trying to build a sustainable business and do right by my employees and customers, but then also trying to figure out, okay, what Pandora's box are we opening up as we, you know, help more people get pot? For me personally, I'm using more pot these days during coronavirus because I'm lonely and anxious and everything's weird and I'm reading too much news and the body counts are going up and the election was a super crazy time. And like the weed just keeps me kind of even. Uh, it helps me feel like 
like when I spin out, when I feel overwhelmed, somebody called, told me I'm, I'm a new dad. I got two kids and I got, you know, this company I'm working on. I want to be a good spouse. And, and, uh, you know, when I talked to um, a, a friend, they said, oh, you're having role overload. So when I feel role overload, I got to be a dad and a husband and a father and a, you know, and a co-founder and a customer service agent. And I'm like, roll overload. And it's like, okay, hit the vape pen, you know, because uh, that's going to help me. If I don't, I get really irritable or I get weepy. Uh, and um, I don't mind being weepy. I don't mind being irritable. Sometimes those are effective emotional states to be in or they're cathartic. But, um, you know, it's just in terms of living my daily life and man and juggling all I'm trying to juggle. I'm a big pot user. Uh, so I believe in the product. Um, I did, I did have a friend who was a little bit, uh, you know, mentally unbalanced in college and he used a lot of pot and it made, I think it like hastened his mental in imbalancing. So I think there's, you know, some edge cases where people don't benefit from exposure to pot. But if you look at all the people who are you know, using pot as an alternative to prescription painkillers or prescription sleep medication. I think this, you know, low dose marijuana can do a lot for people that keeps them from doing worse things. So I feel good about the business we're in. Um, I do think about, uh, I, you know, like as it becomes more available, we just, you know, like, like, are we glad we all have networked mind amplifiers connected to each other? Like, is the internet a good thing? I mean, I think pot's a, a good, it's better than having people in jail. So that's the other thing is that this legacy of pot is a ton of ruined lives and all the people who suffered through a drug war. I didn't suffer through a drug war. I have a colleague who was in jail for selling pot and, you know, let's make that guy have an opportunity to sell pot legally so he can have, you know, a, because uh, he believed in pot before it was legal. I'm lucky. I get to show up. I'm Johnny come lately and sell pot to people through technology. But there are people who took a lot of risks to sell people pot and suffered a lot. And I'm not sure exactly how to make that better. We run a, we've run donation campaigns for the Equal Justice Initiative. So we raise some money and we match the funds and our, our customers donate during checkout to try and help people who you know, need uh, better representation in, in the law. It, it, just thinking about the legacy of pot and trying to do something to um, you know, atone for the birth of you know, legal cannabis uh, on the backs of people, often brown and black people who are still in, many of them still in prison. And I get to be a dad and I get to be around my kids. And I imagine what it would be like if I was trying to sell pot and I couldn't be around my kids because I got arrested. And so it's, you know, I'm a lucky guy. It's a different time. Um, and my timing is good, but there's a lot of pain in our society because of where this thing comes from. You know, I'm grateful that pot has arrived, you know, during coronavirus, we saw like a, in some places we saw a 500% increase in business within like three days once they announced the stay at home order in California. And it was just like a total spike in demand for this thing because people are anxious. And I'll tell you what, when we think as a society, people are lonely and anxious and they're ordered to stay at home. Would you rather they be ordering a lot of weed or a lot of booze? Because if people are alone in their homes, I think it's better if you, if you stick to weed, don't drink alone at home uh, a lot. You know, I think that's not a recipe for sadness. I don't think that's a good society. So I feel good about what we're doing to help people during coronavirus. I feel like we have work to do to try and make sure that a lot of different people have access to this pot opportunity that's, that's growing. And let me just add as one note, I, I came of age with technology in California and I love tech California and all it's done for, for me and so many people as a, as a sort of zone of freedom and experimentation and, and weed being legal and tech being encouraged and these things coming together. But when you look at innovation in cannabis, I'm just like, when coronavirus lifts, I kind of want to take a trip to Oklahoma because in, in California, if you want to get a, wheat, a license to do something in cannabis, you need like 50 grand and a bunch of lawyers and like letters of recommendation and city permits. And if you want to do some weed in Oklahoma, you need 2,300 bucks. And so there are like, if you look at the, in California, you have 30 million people with 600 dispensaries. And in Oklahoma, you have 3 million people with, uh, uh, with um, 1,800 dispensaries. So they have like a tenth the population of three times the dispensaries in Oklahoma because they just kind of unleashed the beast. Sounds like you're living the dream a lot of us had back when I first moved out to Berkeley in the early 70s. 
worked with some people that were doing the California marijuana initiative. And we just thought, you know, it's going to happen. You know, this was like 73, 74. And uh, it didn't. <laughs> but it, well, it did, but it took a while. Yeah, it, it, it took a while. But uh, one aspect that I didn't expect to see happen was medical marijuana. My wife has MS, so she was one mm -hmm. of the early ones to get the card. And I saw that marijuana was not just a thing to, you know, party with, get high, have fun. It was helping people survive and cope with, you know, really bad things. Have you had uh, in, uh, uh, feedback from your customers that are using it for medicinal purposes? Oh, it's, it's deep. I mean, it's deep. Um, you know, uh, I'll be doing customer service and uh, I'll just get a note from somebody and, uh, you know, they'll write about something goes wrong and I'll try and fix it for them. And then I'll, I'll search for their name and I'll say like how, you know, this person wrote me something and it sounds like there's something going on. And uh, I found a GoFundMe page before, you know, like uh, somebody raising money for their medical bills. And I know they're spending some of that money with us to get uh, medicine that, may, that helps them manage a chronic ongoing condition. So, uh, you know, it affects me deeply to, to know that, right? And to, and to wanna make sure that this person's receiving something that's helpful and valuable and legal and, you know, that I, I can vouch for it, but that also it's affordable and we're not, you know, trying to make money off the backs of these people because they're people, you know, when you see an order from someone and they're ordering like uh, certain kinds of products, you can just tell they're, pro they're, they're very likely to be medical. Rip Simpson oil, full spectrum oils, the, a lot of the tincture users, uh, we have suppositories. I mean, it, these are products that, pe these are not party products. Um, these are products for people who are, and, and, they're, and, and often what they're managing is chronic. So this is something that, you know, they're gonna have a relationship with their pain. And right now cannabis is part of managing their relationship with that pain. And it may be that way for decades, or it may be because they're trying to wean off of something else or whatever, but it's, I, it, I'm very aware that, um, you know, when people order from us, you know, uh, and even what we think of as partying, right? I mean, so like some people like to smoke a joint after work, but if they don't smoke a joint after work, they're going to punch a hole in the wall or they're going to, you know, pass out from exhaustion or they're not going to be able to like go out and garden because their knees hurt too much or, you know, like, or they won't be able, they won't feel loose enough to talk to their spouse or they won't, you know, they won't, it's part of their self-care routine. So, you know, especially when partying looks so strange, right? I mean, I, the last time I had a drink with strangers in a room was like, I don't even, you know, it's like so long ago. So what is, what is partying? And now it's like you smoke a joint and you sit in your house and you watch some Netflix. Like, is that partying? I mean, that's just like, it's getting by doing your thing, relaxing, enjoying yourself. So I, I, I definitely, uh, and going to, I'll tell you, going to a lot of marijuana business events, a lot of those people have been transformed because either them or their significant other or their child uh, has had a, a transformative cannabis medical experience. And uh, you, you just talk to these people and they, I, I talked to this one woman from Alabama and she's just really going through it, you know, cause she's like, my kid is suffering, like having seizures, you know? She's watching her kid have seizures and she's like, I know when I go to Colorado and I get this oil, and I bring this oil back, I give it to my kid, my kid doesn't thrash around anymore and they wanna eat and they wanna talk. And the dignity in that, they should be allowed to have that dignity uh, in their it life, Alabama, you know? Right? What's that? She, she can't get access to it legally. No in, way, in Alabama. no way, it's not yeah. legal there yet. And, and that's where, you know, I'm so, I'm so encouraged that the Republicans especially are coming around to this and I think it's a lot about the kids and the, and the significant others and the medical. It's all the medical stuff because you just can't get past it. You know, if you want to treat someone who's having epilepsy, you need to consider THC and CBD. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I get so worked up about it. Because I just, when I interact with these people who are so clearly suffering and so clearly get so much benefit from it, you know? Um, it just makes so much sense that it would be legal. And then, yeah. and I don't, I don't need to sell it to them, make it legal so they can grow it. And, 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 you know, like, I don't need to sell pot to everybody. I think it's great that, you know, 
we can be a, a conduit for things because if you if you if you don't have people that know how to grow it and prepare tinctures for you, it's kind of a lot of work to make a, a good tincture with a dose you can trust. So what we sell is the predictability of the doses and stuff. But man, people are desperate if they have someone who's sick and they want to get them weed and and some somebody growing something in their community could be enough to really help those people, you know. So how are you guys sourcing it? Do you actually uh, cultivate your own supply or? Yeah, no. So, so um, bud.com basically we realized quickly that um, we're some of the, when we meet with people in the cannabis industry, we're often some of the most technologically literate people. Uh, and they are people who are really good at growing. They're really good at retail. They're really good at, you know, manufacturing or packaging or all these other parts of it, but they're not necessarily good at, reaching audiences online or building websites or corresponding with people, building email flows, all those things. They don't know how to do that stuff. Customer service that help desks. So we, that's what we decided to do. We were going to build the services that dispensaries needed to start delivering in their communities. So rather than try to build out our own whole supply chain, we, we, we tried it a tiny bit. And then we said, no, no, these dispensaries are already in their communities, sourcing products, running storefronts, keeping inventory, and they need new channels to reach customers to, you know, to stay alive and thrive. So we work with, a, a, you know, sort of a, a select dispensary partners around California, and they have their supply chains and we tap into them. So if we work with the Cannabis Buyers Club of Berkeley and in the Cannabis Buyers Club of Berkeley, you know, they have their menu and we may suggest, oh, we like these gummies or you should add these, these uh, gummy, these, uh, you know, wow, this per company now makes a cannabis inhaler. You should stock that. And then they could put that into their product flow. But really we, we lean on them to source what the, the, the area is consuming. And then we put up a menu for them and run a customer service process for them and advertise delivery availability online, and then take the customer through the delivery journey and then help the people in the dispensary run the dashboard and the dispatching and the customer service correspondence and so we're like the technology I, intermediary right yeah technology and customer service and in, intermediary for those dispensaries and you know we're about to start working with the los angeles patient caregivers group and it's another instance where they're just a really small this local dispensary in west hollywood they've been around forever wow. and they want to start doing delivery because they can't because nobody's doing foot traffic sales anymore so if you like this you know 10 plus year old dispensary in, in West Hollywood, LAPCG, we're going to help them become a delivery provider. Wow. So I, I think we've run out of time now and we'd really love for you to come back sometime because I think we're just grazing the surface of this. We'd really like to talk about your current business some more. Oh, shucks. Uh, I'm flattered. And I, I love that I'm in, I'm in a, you know, continuum with fringe wear to electric mines to not all the stories you've, uncovered and you yeah know, you're a thank plutopian you. thank you thank you john i'm grateful welcome to our planet good to meet you yeah, yeah we'll send yeah, you a t-shirt and teach you the secret handshake right on okay well thanks justin thanks so much for joining us today and uh again we'll follow up with you sometime we'll do this again okay thank you guys so much i look forward to chatting with you and keep on trucking you can follow the plutopia news network at plutopia.io on Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.